Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Cup Reviews, brought to you by Cup of Hemlock Theater. I am your marketing manager and host, Mackenzie, and tonight we have a really fantastic episode set up for you. We're going to be talking about the 2019 production of Othello, directed by Nigel Sean Williams, and it had an incredible cast behind it included uh, Michael Blake, who we've seen several times on this series so far, including as Macduff in the Scottish play. As uh, uh, as Othello, you had Laura Condolan, uh, who we talked about last episode in her 2011 production of Mary Wise, but this time she's playing the role of Amelia. You have Amelia uh, Sangerson playing Desdemona, Gordon S. Miller as Iago. You have Jonathan uh, Sousa as Cassio, uh, Juan Kiorn as Levitico. Uh, you have Farhan uh, Gaher as Rodrigo. And we have the wonderful David Collins as Senator. And we have David coming back to us for another week. So welcome back, David, for your second episode of The Cup. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And what is in your cup tonight? I mean, last time you had a great heart bar off. That you were mm. drinking. What is it tonight? Well, tonight the senator's having some herbal tea. He's, uh, ah. Yeah, he's going to chill out a little today. Love it. Love nice. That. <laughs> Love that. That's, that seems like a very nice, like, political ease drink because you were very much the calming presence in, the, in, in those political scenes that we saw at the top of the show. So it is a yeah. perfect fit. Uh, and we are joined once again by our lovely uh, friend of the company, Tanisha. Uh, uh, Sinclair. Hello, Tanisha. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. This is a great production. I'm excited to talk about it. Yes. Uh, and this is, how many episodes have you, have you done now? You were on Hamlet with us. You did Anthony Cleopatra. I think this is my third. This Thanks. is your third. So, so hat trick. You, you've got a hat trick now. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what is in your cup tonight? I have some lovely mango juice in my Ooh. little gauntlet thing. <laughs> nice. Very, very nice. I like that. Not a lot of people drink mango juice. It's always like orange juice or apple juice. Nobody does mango oh, juice. I feel mango, mango juice is very underrated. Best oh. juice. So underrated. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then we have our wonderful general assistant of Cup of Hemlock. She keeps us all on track here. Uh, it is the wonderful... Uh, Jillian Robinson, who is also an aunt again. So congratulations, Yay. Jill. We should mark this episode as, as uh, the day where you were able to welcome another member of your family into the world. So yes. congratulations and thank welcome. Thank you so much, Mac. I hope you're doing well tonight as well. Oh, I am. Thank you. Awesome. What is your ensemble and what is in your cup tonight? Yes. Yeah, so in my cup tonight, because the two vice drink vices present in this production were either wine or beer, and I've already mm -hmm. done wine a couple times in this panel, I have yet to do beer. So I got oh. myself a nice little pitcher of beer going. <laughs> Specifically, it is a land shark because of mm -hmm. the sharky backstabby vibes that we have Ooh. that is iago and othello mm -hmm. um and as for my ensemble i couldn't find anything with strawberries on it so i thought pineapples would suffice yes um and then i am earringless tonight and i have a bit of a slick back look to um stand in solidarity with the female soldiers that were um, mm. wonderfully represented in this piece so yes. That is my vibe for tonight. I love it. A wonderful layered look you, you have. It's, it's perfect. Awesome. Uh, but why don't we uh, dive right into this wonderful uh, uh, production? I mean, as we said, it's the 2019 production of Othello. It's found on the Cineplex store because we've now finished with the YouTube. Actually, as of Thursday, Timing of the Shrew came down on YouTube. So now it is not available there, but you can purchase them all on the website. The Sharper Festival website, uh, but you can find Othello and Mary Watch from last week on the Cineplex store. So we're kind of into a new area of this uh, virtual world. Uh, and so, yeah, but yeah, well, let's talk Othello. So uh, the first question right off the bat is how did this modern setting of this particular Othello production uh, affect the way you viewed, or in David, your case, the way you played uh, these characters? Uh, so, David, because you were in this uh, production, and I don't know if you've done Othello before this, like, I, I, I'm not sure if you were in the 2013 production with Dion Johnson as well, 
Um, but like, how did this production setting kind of inform the way you tackled your role as the senator? Okay. Um, well, as you'll see uh, when you watch the uh, video, uh, mm -hmm. the senator is there and then he disappears for the rest mm -hmm. of the play. Mm -hmm. I always justified it as he went to his vineyard in Sardinia just to get away <laughs> from all of this stuff because he could see what was coming. Yeah. Um, but I mean, uh, certainly it, it makes things a lot easier for a modern actor to uh, play a, a, a powerful man in a powerful mm -hmm. suit. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. not out there in a toga. Uh, yeah, I'm not out there in pumpkin pants. I'm in a suit and tie and, and good mm -hmm. shoes. As long as you're in good shoes, you know where you are. Um, and uh, it certainly uh, brought focus to the uh, to the female characters uh, in the play, the female soldiers and uh, and Amelia particularly mm -hmm. uh, in in this production, uh, which uh, which I really appreciated about the, about the show. And Laura, I mean, absolutely knocked it out of the park. Every she did. Single um mm -hmm. i would uh i would be in the dressing room listening to her in those last couple of scenes and ah yeah. so much truth uh mm -hmm. so grounded uh mm -hmm. and every time it was new it, it was like she'd never said it before these she was so in the moment uh yeah and it was new every single time you know, mm -hmm. she's, uh, she's an amazing amazing actor and i was yeah. so glad uh, she got a chance to really showcase herself mm -hmm. in this extremely problematic play mm -hmm. um, particularly it just got even more complicated in the last couple of months mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because uh, it all depends on who's watching it mm -hmm. is going is going to determine uh, what kind of play it is mm -hmm. uh, for me I'll tell you um, a couple of days before we opened, we were on stage and uh, they were rehearsing the um, the murder scene, the murder scene of uh, Desdemona. And I happened to be in the house and, uh, and uh, you know, it was, the lights were coming down and they wanted to, to do, it, do the scene. And I wound up sitting about four rows back from the, from the front seat. So it was right there. I mean, I could have... Uh, taken a piece of paper and thrown it. It was right at the corner of the bed. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking, it, it was 10, 12 feet away from me. Mm -hmm. And I, my, I, my body absolutely freaked out. Mm -hmm. Sitting that close to something so incredibly horrifically violent. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I was imagining somebody that wasn't prepared. I, I knew the fight scene was gonna happen. Now, uh, imagining somebody who's coming to the show, never seen the show before, and is going to be sitting 10 feet away and witnessing th that scene. Mm -hmm. Abs absolutely mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. um, I have to admit, I've had a, a long, complicated relationship with the play. Uh, I've never played the, the whole uh, role. Um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, I used to do the... Uh, the scene um, that uh, with Amelia and Desdemona, when uh, Othello tells Desdemona get, to get lost and then basically attacks and uh, accusing uh, Desdemona of, of mm -hmm. uh, infidelity. And we did that in the high schools. And uh, it became a discussion about uh, abuse against women, uh, mm -hmm. uh, male aggression, uh, 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 and we were doing, I remember we did it, we did it the week that Mark Lapine shot up uh, that school in Montreal. Mm. Oh, Polytech, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that was the level the kids took it on. Uh, race isn't mentioned at all. This is a couple, uh, mm -hmm. obviously in a lot of trouble. And that's what they were witnessing and that's what they related to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, the language didn't matter. They understood what was going on between this man and this woman, okay. um, and they understood it on a on a personal level. They saw it in their own lives. They saw it in their 
sometimes in their in their parents' homes, uh, sometimes in their own in their own life. I remember one time we did it, and a young lady uh, confessed that that's what how her boyfriend was treating her. And uh, wouldn't you know, the next class, her boyfriend showed up into the class, into into the following class, and that's what somebody pointed out to me that. Uh, this was a young man, the young, young woman in the previous class had been referring to. So I made a point of asking him a lot of questions yeah. about what he yeah. thought about what was going on. In the world. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, the play. Uh, you have to give uh, Mr. Shakespeare a little bit of credit because it's an adaptation of a short story. Mm -hmm. uh, it was written by an Italian dude. Um, I don't know exactly when, but he had to stick to the facts in the story, mm -hmm. and that's what he did. Uh, but what he also did was he jacked up the racism. He jacked up the rage uh, that Daddy had against his his her his daughter marrying this black man. Um, jacked up the rage um, of the uh, of the senators. Uh, not all the senators were all rah rah for this uh, for this union. In fact, uh, Sean directed me to be the one senator that was sort of in his corner uh, when when he brings all of this to the uh, to speak to the Duchess. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, he disappears. So, not much of an ally, you know. <laughs> you get yeah. uh, but you get right down to it. It's um, it's a, it's a manifesto on why you cannot give black men power. You cannot allow them to marry white women. They're weak, they're malleable. And this is, this is the narrative of the play. Um, and it makes it even, brings it even more into focus when we're talking uh, Black Lives Matter and this whole period that we've been going through. Mm -hmm. uh, it's part of the canon. It's mm -hmm. uh, written by Shakespeare. It's done over and over and over again. Uh, <laughs> I was reading something today. Originally, this is a play written by a black man uh, to be performed by, excuse me, written about a black man by a white man to be performed by a w white man in blackface. Mm -hmm. That was the original premise of the play. They weren't even thinking about black men playing Othello uh, when it was originally uh, written. Mm -hmm. um, but we see it from a different point of view now, um, particularly now, than the audience would have seen it when it was written in the 1600s. This is uh, pre-transatlantic slave trade, uh, pre-civil rights movement, pre-apartheid in South Africa, pre-all of that stuff. So we look at it at, at, as a, to, as a, from a totally different lens. Um, I was even of the argument that it shouldn't be done anymore mm -hmm. until today, actually. Um, I was uh, watching this video about a production that's going on in, uh, or was going on in England. <laughs> Excuse me, the RSC was doing it. And there was a black man playing Iago. Mm -hmm. And for me, that, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's compelling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, actually, uh, a friend of mine, Andre Alexis, he's a novelist. He's, well, he used to write plays too. Uh, he suggested it to me like 20 years ago. And it's like, you know, that's a really interesting point of view. Yeah. It's kind of sophisticated racial politics. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, a hell of a lot more compelling uh, then let's sit and watch it. This uh, this not very bright general of men, you know that paradox. Uh, in the modern day army, uh, to get one star, you have to have a master's degree. So every star you see on these dudes' shoulders is a master's degree. These are not fools. These are not simpletons. These are not easily manipulated men. Mm -hmm. Uh, but unfortunately, that's the narrative of this play. Yeah. Um, 
Does it need to be done now? Yeah, but it needs to be ripped apart and put back together again. If, mm -hmm. if you need to do the poll. Agreed. You've got to come up with a really strong argument. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other than, well, you know, it's, it's dealing with race. Yeah, it's dealing with race, but the same way that uh, Birth of a Nation was dealing with race. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Well said. Uh, well, I mean, whew. Yeah. I, I, was, I was so well said, David. Like, well, I've also had an awful long time to think about this. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, of course. Because, you know, I've been doing this a long time. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Othello has always been sort of out there and floating around. And uh, mm -hmm. and the opportunity is, is uh, other than this uh, this experience in the, in the school, uh, it never, uh, never crossed my path until mm -hmm. this year. And uh, even sitting in rehearsal, it was, hmm. How how do how does Dave feel about this? Right. The overall big picture of life. Is this a play we need to be doing? Is this a play we need to be doing this way? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but what re really made it work for me was was Laura Laura Collins' performance and 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 Amelia Sargenton too. Uh, mm -hmm. Desdemona had balls. Yeah. yeah. Her Desdemona was not a a weak frail little thing. Uh, right. She stood, you know, Michael's a, a foot taller than her and weighs her by 60 pounds and mm -hmm. she stood toe to toe with him. And, you yeah. know, I thought that was, that was cool. It was cool to see that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it was not cool to see that. I couldn't. Mm -hmm. After, particularly after that, that rehearsal, I said, I'm good with that. I'm going to, I'll be in the green room until that's over and then I'll come and get ready because, uh, yeah, that was so disturbing. Uh, mm -hmm. That was uh, Anita. Yeah. The fight director, a, a female directed that fight. Wow. Nice. Yeah. That's, That's good yeah. to know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Bertoli. yeah. Anita Bertoli. That's her name. Mm -hmm. yeah. Lovely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Tanisha, what are your thoughts on, on, on this particular setting of this Othello? Like, how did that affect the way you viewed these characters of this play? Um, well, this is the first time I've actually ever encountered Othello. I've never mm -hmm. read it uh, or seen a production of it. So watching it, it was very interesting, especially in this sort of like uh, modern uh, production setting. I mm -hmm. thought for me specifically, it helped me to clearly just see like what the themes were of the play. Mm -hmm. And um, since they helped me to see like how there's a lot of things that weren't just uh, time specific, like... Mm -hmm. I love how you, uh, David Hollitz was talking about how, like, yes, it was written in the 1600s in this very specific way. And I, uh, just, that made me think for a second, but at the same time, I was like, there's a lot of things that are also, like, uh, like he also said, true to this day, that people can still relate to, like the relationship, um, the toxic relationship, the, uh, even somebody being, like, easily manipulated. Um, mm -hmm. And it just helped me put it into, like, the perspective of, I guess, 2020, where, where we are now, and um, just relating the issues back to, like, yeah, like Black Lives Matter, and, and just, like, even, I, I thought a lot about the women's issues, like, how the women were treated in this play, especially Desdemona, um, but that's, yeah, that's, that's where my mind went exactly, to. I was like, okay, this mm -hmm. is just, it's, this play is problematic, but at the mm -hmm. same time, relatable. Yeah, that mm -hmm. makes any sense. For sure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, mm -hmm. That's why we still do three or 400 years later, because it's human experience. You know? Yeah, mm -hmm. and I was also thinking a lot too, like what you said about like, um, just like changing, like I don't think you said rip it up and put it back together. Cause I was, I was kind of thinking that like just changing the way it's done. Yeah. Like, this could totally be done with um, a, a, I was just thinking like, not an all black cast, but what if it was like mostly black, and then you chose to like cast their, like what if Cassio was was actually white, and then mm -hmm. it had a different conversation, um, right. especially just now. Into like, it just made me think because you maybe like a decade or a few decades ago, it would there was some people had the idea where I was like, oh, if you or to marry a white man as a black woman, it would help you prosper because they have so much privilege. And um, like, I feel like 
a lot of people today, it, because of Black Lives Matter, it's almost like the reverse. It's like, no, like, black people need to marry black people and stick together. So there's just like, it, it unlocked a lot of things in my mind thinking about like how we could have different conversations about race because there's so much there to talk about mm -hmm. and and also women's issues as well it made me think of like uh are women still able to like voice their opinions as much as they want to in, in relationships and like how can they go about doing that without seeming like they're just this emotional crazy person how how can like women's voices be validated in relationships mm -hmm. in today's society because it's still hard for men to talk about their own like feelings and stuff so mm -hmm. i feel like maybe that's partly why it's hard for them to listen to it i don't know it just unlocked mm -hmm. all of these tangents in my mind <laughs> yeah how we could continue to do this play absolutely yeah yeah to Joe. piggyback off that yeah um I definitely, I think with this modern setting, um, one of the big notes I wrote down was there's definitely more agency available to all the women in the play, like especially in the realm of soldiers. Um, and especially like David literally said my exact note of, of Amelia. Um, you know, I have I have seen, I saw the 2013 production and I do remember that take of Amelia. I mean, it can go either way. Like she can have hardly any agency and kind of fall just victim to Iago, which we'll get to mm -hmm. further down the line, know. or would this piece really placed her in, in a position of power, um, even though she does falter at the end. And mm -hmm. um, it just allowed for that, like Tanisha was saying, like that female voice to, to not be squelched mm -hmm. as sometimes I find that that can happen with that character in particular. Um, and the, the solidarity of the female soldiers at the end of the piece was a really wonderful sort of tie up of all that. Um, and then I, I've mentioned this a lot with, with the pattern of, of the f depiction of the female in a lot of the um, productions we've hit on this Sh Stratford series. And um, this production too really lend a great scope into the levels of, of femininity or levels of female um, that are present and, and, and how, you know, you, you can have this, the sweeter side of the female, you can have the feistier side, you can have, um, you know, the, the mm -hmm. submissive, but yet you can have the, um, the like sneaky sidekick. It just, it just added for more broad breadth of, of the female identity. Um, and each woman on that stage to me, like had a mixture of all those things, which was really lovely to see. Um, and I think the modern setting really helped to kind of cushion that and, and encourage that. And then similar to kind of what David was saying too, like, the specific costumes really helped emphasize the different status of, mm. of folks on the stage, you know, whether it be like your rank in the army or, you know, if you're in a suit versus your uniform and like that whole dialogue came into play, you know, like mm -hmm. who has the upper hand in these kind of scenes, you know, it kind of made you think and open up tangents like Tanisha mm -hmm. was saying. Um, and the idea of violence too, kind of like David, I had goosebumps through all of the fight choreo in this piece um, because it was so raw and I couldn't imagine, like, I mean, we, we were seeing it through a lens and, and, you know, up front, but I, at least there was the cushion of a screen, like what David was saying, I can't imagine sitting front or even in that, in the theater. Um, Cause I also think, Two, there's layers in like the hitting of women and also the idea of war um, and substance abuse and that whole dialogue came into play mm -hmm. too, right? It actually reminded me of, I don't know if you folks have seen the movie, Thank You for Your Service, mm -hmm. um, about a bunch of vets that come back from um, the Iraq war and it just kind of follows their life post-war and how their relationships are severely affected by mm -hmm. PTSD, substance abuse, etc. cetera. And, um, so those layers were definitely woven into this piece for me too. Um, that again, brings relevance to to this piece that I think if it was set in a, an era beyond uh, mm -hmm. sort of like semi-present day, it wouldn't necessarily ring as true. Um, and then even just simply the idea that there was multiple different weapons because we're living in a modern age, right? It's like you have the ability of a gun or like a dagger or, like a Swiss army knife, it, it, it just added that element of suspense and like d 
disbelief and so many different things were happening. The stakes were just a bit higher, I think, with this modern setting. Um, and like we've already kind of chatted about, I would love to mm -hmm. unpack this even more and explore mm -hmm. it with even more stepping stones that have already um, presented themselves. Because, yeah, this, I think this piece sort of stretched out can can hit on a lot of topical um mm -hmm. things happening right now and mm -hmm. yeah that's yeah. that was my set on on that <laughs> wonderful uh i'll say for me i mean what this modern setting did more than anything was it made me question the world and the characters that a fellow interacts with like a lot of times when I, I, watching older productions of a fellow like a fellow is usually only after of um color in the production, everybody else is usually, it's always usually just a sea of white. But the fact that we had all these wonderful different people, uh, uh, like David, you were playing the senator. We had, um, I forget her name, but she played uh, Bianca um, mm -hmm. uh, in this, where we had different people of different races, different colors, waking yeah. up this world. And so because of that, it made me just question, especially, it made me question the white, pe the white, the white characters even more, where where the whole time you were like, are you really genuine and supporting of a fellow in, in this, in these moments? Cause like Juan Caron's character as uh, this kind of lordly figure, he like, he's very much like, I've heard so much about you. Like you seem so lovely. Like um, the Duchess was once again, like she had some lovely moments there on stage. Um, but then you like, you're always questioning because it's like, are you actually like more like Iago and um, Desdemona's father, uh, Barbantino, where it's like when push comes to shove that, false mask that you wear in front of society where you're all PC and friendly to the world, but really underneath you have that awful underbelly of really racism and hatred. Right marry my daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, 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 I can push on the shove, that mask comes off and it's something that we're confronting now in the world with, with, every, with everybody in society, especially our politicians and our leaders and these people of power where it's like, are you actually someone who is an ally and supportive of uh, of minorities and people of different races and different cultures or are you just putting up this fake yeah. facade that the minute push comes to shove you're going the other way so mm -hmm. the whole time i was watching this i was like i don't trust a lot of these white characters like i i, I, I especially people of power where it's like mm -hmm. i just i could i couldn't trust them like i just didn't know where they were gonna fall mm -hmm. and i thought that was really interesting view because i think if you just did pumpkin pants where it was just othello as the other and you can separate him out very easily from that world and everybody's kind of othering him but when you have this world that's uh mixed and integrated and appears as a facade of we're all welcoming we're all getting along we're all going out partying together but really what is going on mm -hmm. behind your social masks as it were mm -hmm. so yeah the whole time i was watching i just felt really compelled to question all these characters and i thought that uh natural sean williams did a really wonderful job of creating this world that the, the whole time you never got bored because you were always questioning and thinking of what's going on like uh, uh, behind your uh facades that we all put up in the world mm -hmm. john understands the way the world operates he's a black man mm -hmm. Yeah, trying to be a, a theater artist in this world and and yeah. that is the experience Mm -hmm. yep. Are you really on my side? Do you really support me? And what would happen if I came home and started dating your daughter? Yeah. That's Does exactly that... it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and can I really trust you? Uh, yeah. That 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 becomes your job as a as an a, a theater artist of color. That becomes your job. Mm -hmm. First of all, you got to figure out who you could trust and who you can't trust. And secondly, you realize very soon that you're living, you're in a world where most of these people have had very little, if any, contact with Black people. Mm -hmm. In a yeah. lot of cases, you're the first one they've ever really met and sat down and talked to. Mm -hmm. um, and it becomes your job to make them feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And the sooner you realize that, the easier things get. Mm -hmm. Why is it so tense around here? It's not because you're tense. It's because mm -hmm. they're tense. Yeah. And you got to turn it around. Mm -hmm. And once you do, then everybody figures out how to relax. Mm -hmm. But that's that's a skill that you have to learn to mm -hmm. navigate. 
-hmm. when you mm -hmm. are the other. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Whether like that's high school, whether that's college, whether that's mm -hmm. working world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Ab absolutely. I, I, I don't know how I, I, I just, David, you're just hitting so many nails on the head right now. Like, I, just, <laughs> I just can't piggyback on because there's just, cause you just hail it so well. Like, well, you're, you're, again, you're... I have a lot more time to think about this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> guys, absolutely. You know, uh, uh, I've been doing this longer than most of you have been alive. All of you have been alive. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Uh, I, very early on, this is what I wanted to do, and I had to figure out a way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, when there was no path, there wasn't anybody in front of me. She said, oh, yeah, come on. I'll, I'll mentor you through this. I think that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, all, the, all there was was, uh, you know, sort of peaks I wanted to, uh, to reach. Mm -hmm. And while I'm saying that, I just want to mention um, today, um, uh, one of the the best actor this country ever produced uh, uh, passed away a couple of days ago, Brent Carver. Yeah, Brent Carver. Yes. Uh, yes. I saw Brent Carver when I was 17, 18, and I knew I wanted to kind of be an actor, but I didn't quite know what this, you know, is this just a dog and pony show? Am I, are these people just running around the stage showing off because they, you know, they didn't get enough attention as a child? And then I saw Brent Carver and I went, oh, that's what this is all about. Yeah. I want to learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. I thought the bar was here, and Brent showed me it's, it's right. up there. Yeah. That's how far you can go with it. Yes, mm -hmm. you can be the dog and pony actor, or you can be extraordinary. Yep. Yeah. And I went, yeah, extraordinary. And every time I saw him, he destroyed me. Mm -hmm. uh, his uh, Elephant Man at Ken Stage in the mm -hmm. I think it was early 2000s. Mm -hmm. Him basically wearing a diaper, doing the, just doing the physicality of, of the Elephant Man. And his Jacques Brel, mm -hmm. I cried from the first note to the last. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know where the tears were coming from. It was just so beautiful. Yeah. Um, yeah anyway yeah yes sorry i just wanted to, to say Brent. no yeah no. absolutely I, 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 absolutely i mean like my dad still talks about brent carver like, he goes behind topol he was the best tevia he'd ever yeah. seen on stage and, and like when i told him yesterday like he, like he even he has just a general theater audience goer mm -hmm. realized the loss of brent and just the power that he had mm -hmm. uh on stage mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. He is definitely somebody who will be missed, um, mm -hmm. for sure. And yeah, well said, David, well said. Interesting that, you know, it, it, his life was on stage. He, it wasn't mm -hmm. about television. That's not what, uh, what, what, what drew him. Yeah. Fame wasn't what he was interested in. He was yeah. interested in being a theater artist. And went, mm -hmm. Oh, that's mm -hmm. a way to look at it. That's another way. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, I was young, I was ambitious, you know, sure. I want to be on a soap opera, I want to be famous, I want to be on E.T. Tonight, da 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 And you very sort of quickly figure out that that's mm -hmm. less than vacuous. Mm -hmm. Because uh, whoever is the it person today, check with me in three years from now. Yeah. So gone and somebody else is there. Yeah. You know, right. uh, trying to achieve fame, is what drives people keeping it, trying to keep it, is what mm -hmm. ultimately tears them apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Ab let's talk about Elvis, let's talk about Michael Jackson, let's talk about Prince, let's talk about uh, Amy Winehouse, the list, it just goes on and on mm -hmm. and on, you know? Yeah. So uh, you want to sustain yourself, be an artist, yeah. and let the rest of it do whatever it wants to do, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. As name comes, it goes, you know, just want to work, just want to do it, you know, mm -hmm. and do it like Mr. Carver did. Yes. You take your heart and transform it. You mm -hmm. don't need mm -hmm. that space, the same person you were when you walked into it. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and that's the kind of power you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Everyone get out your notebooks and write down the words of wise coming from David Collins. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, so true. So, so true. Um, all right. But why don't we dive into the next question? Yes. Uh, which is kind of a neat one because uh, this set um, was very minimal and it uh, used projections, which is something we don't see a lot done at the festival. Uh, particularly on the uh, festival stage because it's a thrust and projecting on the thrust is never an easy feat. But this pr set uh, used it. Uh, so did this uh, set pr uh, uh, projections um, enhance your viewing experience? Uh, Jill, you're like nodding and yes. you're like eager and ready to jump on this I'm one. I'm jonesing so I'll, for this one. I'll let you dive right in. Um, this production just hats off to the cast because mm -hmm. I have... I love minimalist sets, minimalist sort of like scopes of productions. Mm -hmm. But with that, like it's got to be jam packed with so much energy and chemistry of the cast and company. Otherwise, like it's literally going to fall flat because there's lack of any other spectacle that's kind of lifting mm -hmm. you. So even though the proje projections was kind of like a, an amazing aha moment each time they switched, um, it was still simplistic enough that just like, mm -hmm the life existed in the bodies on stage. And I just, again, I just want to like hats off to the whole cast because the chemistry was so rich. And um, I was never sitting back in my seat. I was only always on the edge. There were so many mm -hmm. twists and turns and the projections were just a lovely sort of like blanket supporting what was happening. And um, the dramaturge in me went wild because it, the, the images were abstract enough to kind of like let your brain kind of interpret it the way you wanted it to but it was specific enough to be like oh yeah like I can't see that being any other way like mm -hmm. um so I guess sorry where do I where do I jump in um so basically the production the projections for me were very it added a very atmospheric vibe throughout the whole piece mm -hmm. um and one sort of scope of how I looked at it um it supported the mental states of Iago a lot for me like the clouding smoke and the waves crashing in. Um, and then, but then as I'm talking about this too, I'm like, oh, that could also just the crashing and sort of smoky fogginess of falsity of relationships that's happening like on the stage as well. Um, and it's, it's just interesting that the play opens with sort of Iago kind of acting like a marionette sort of operator with his like cloud of, um, peg people around him with the union of Othello and Desdemona happening upstage. Um, so it was from there that I'm like, okay, like maybe this is where the root of the projection sort of stem from that moment. Mm -hmm. And then it was after his scene with Rodrigo when sort of the creation of the neighborhood doors happened, it almost seemed like Iago was summoning that up. And then, so it was cool because I hooked into like, okay, projections sort of like the scope of Iago's mind, lovely. But then as it started to develop, and then we also had like not only smoke on the projections, but like the fog coming in onto the stage, I was like, oh my goodness, we're using two different theatrical elements to like emphasize that. And like, now I feel like this is like an Othello sort of backdrop that's, that's supporting this moment. So it really added so much, um, little dramaturgical significance that I think would be present in like a prop or a set or what have you but it was just like the fact that it was just like the backdrop and it was it literally added depth to the stage like <laughs> quite literally again in a scene with Iago and Rodrigo like the depth of sort of the alleyway but then it just added this deeper thinking and and um rooting into these characters and then it also um sort of like the scrim aspect of it too when seeing the people behind those the projections so there's moments when like amelia is sort of eavesdropping what's happening on stage and then othello has his whole eavesdropping and aside moments and they're behind that like sort of scrim panel that also has a projection on it i'm like okay now again we have a multi-layered sort of um people in like the fog the falseness um it was just like a glaze that that covered the whole story. Um, sorry, I have my notes. I'm making sure I'm not forgetting anything. Um, and then the sheer fact that it was it had us play in like grays 
and or blacks and whites throughout the whole piece. Um, it again paid homage to to the battle of race that's at hand. And then also the gray imagery sort of leaching in too is how like a lot of these characters operate on the gray scale too. Like we talked about too, like, are you a true ally? Are you not? Like, where do you lie? Manipulation, right? Like to me, that's a very like gray hue. And it's like that comes in through like these puffs of smoke and these like the rainfall and the crashing of the waves, right? And so um yeah, I just I was I was gung ho about these projections. And I've <laughs> seen many, many productions and in the series in general too that the lack of set and props just didn't hit it for me because the energy of the cast wasn't on par. And I think it's it's with this like beautiful explosion of dramaturgical digitalized world complementing the juiciness and intensity of of the human contact on stage that was just like a double a double hitter. Um, I love how reasonably literate you are. I know, I'm literally <laughs> over here, I'm quaking with excitement. Uh, and I'm trying not to use the same words over and over. So I'm like, ooh, juicy, we'll throw that in there. Thanks to my pineapples, I was able to find that of, word. A lot of the tourists didn't like that visual uh, imagery. They, right. they want it all, you know, cut and dried and, and all drawn out for them. And I think your, your view is a lot more exciting. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, again, it just, it talks to the conversation of, and we had this conversation in last week's panel too, of like, if we want to do these pieces, we have to do them in a way that's going to resonate with today. Mm -hmm. And whether that be like today message wise or today, like production wise being like, let's digitalize and liveness this sucker so that it sort of can speak to a broader audience. Right. And so right. It, it makes is more visually literate. Certainly, their mind mind was and and uh, right. and if if this stuff is going to stay alive, like you said, you got to find ways to communicate to the people that are alive now. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, yeah, a a plus for those projections. <laughs> well, again, that's uh, Denise Karn and uh, and Nigel uh, working together, and the technology Beautiful. is just sort of starting to catch up with us visually too. Yeah. Uh, one thing I've been I do is I watch concerts on uh, on YouTube, and and the projections and stuff like that. That's starting to sink into uh, into uh, the theater world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As much as video games are starting to mesh together with uh, with motion picture movies, mm -hmm. motion pictures. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's all becoming a, a mesh. Mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, David, since you were in the room during the rehearsals, I mean, did uh, Nigel and uh it's and sorry her name uh, denise or yeah yeah denise uh, uh, did they kind of explain to you what they were going for with those projections oh yeah they, yeah i mean yeah. Yeah, uh, from from day one i mean denise came in and and and, and did a presentation uh she even had some mock-up pictures that she projected on the on the scene uh maquette cool. but really until we got in the room and put those uh, screens up and the scrims we like I, I had anything to do with it. <laughs> it was, it was put that up. Um, you, they really didn't know what the effect was going to be because it, 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 like you said, it's never been tried on the stage before. But right. I, obviously, it was a smashing success with you guys and me too. Yeah. I thought it was fantastic. You know, mm -hmm. mm. between that and the lighting, that's how you get the uh, the scrim effects. It's, it's it's all lighting stuff and, and expanding the space and making it really small and tight mm -hmm. without having to move walls. It also helps keep the pace of the show up, right? Yes. There's not people hauling furniture all and off and mm -hmm. you know crew guys moving you know big pieces of set around. So mm -hmm. it keeps the audience in the play. Um, as long as we stay ahead of you, you're going to have a good time. If you guys. Yeah. Are, are thinking ahead of us, it's mm -hmm. not going to be a very interesting night of theater. It and also just, yeah, one last thing too, it kept it so raw because like the thing with having like a digitalized projection as opposed to like moving of set pieces or walls or what have you, like as the audience, like that is what you're seeing, right? So like what is projected on that screen, you're made to see. Whereas like, you know, if it was this moving set piece or what have you, where you're sitting in the theater, you might get a certain view of something else. Um, and then you sit in that in that comfort or, or what have you. But with the projections, it's kind of like, bam, and this is not moving. So it's like, this is what you're seeing. Um, and, and it to me too, it adds 
some people would probably think it's more distracting, but to me, it kind of wasn't because it was like, okay, this is the two dimensional thing that I'm just supposed to like kind of see in the background. And then I could focus more on the three dimensional mm -hmm. reactions and, and relationships happening in front of it. It's exactly. And, and that's exactly what it does. It makes yeah. us even more three dimensional. Yeah. And, it, and it's, we don't see it at all. You know, I'm, I'm not looking at what's going on the wall behind me, you know, right. I'm, I'm trying to engage in this scene here. I'm trying right. to affect somebody or being affected by somebody, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what you guys get to witness. Yeah. Not us trying to navigate or, oh, I got to get around this. Yeah, place. yeah. I'd be like, oh, I don't want to trip over that ottoman during this fight <laughs> sequence, you know? It's yeah. The rugs. It's always the rugs. Right. The yeah. Designs, they want rugs on the floor. And of course, somebody's going to trip over them. Of course. <laughs> and then there's yeah. five rehearsals using different ad adhesives to keep the rugs down, you know? It's like, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Uh, Tanisha, for you, since this was your first time seeing a production of Othello, like how did these projections kind of influence the way you watched Othello since this was kind of your first experience with it? Um, I, I loved them. Like I am a, a lighting geek. So when it comes to like that, a production, that's something that I always like just take especially into account and watching the productions with the lighting, it just like, it blew my mind because I was like, oh my gosh, this just makes me think of so many things I can do in the future and I just I loved it because it, it like everything that Jill said like just everything she said everything they said y'all took my points <laughs> <laughs> didn't take um, no no it's good um, or that yeah like it just it didn't take me out of the production at all like it wasn't distracting um mm -hmm. I, I was I was very much like it just added layers um, which I guess I guess was said already, but, but yeah, it was just really amazing to watch. It tied into like the modernization, which I thought was perfect, because if you're if you're gonna do a modernized play, like you have to, mm -hmm. like yeah, like use the technology available to you mm -hmm. to exactly what everybody said, like grip the audience that's gonna come watch it, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it just all the points that I had were said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like literally all my points but I just I, I loved it a lot and it it was just it hit me so much more emotionally because yeah mm -hmm. the pain was just there right I was mm -hmm. never like oh I know like I didn't obviously know what was gonna happen but there was no like me predicting. I was mm -hmm. always like oh mm -hmm. my gosh and the mm -hmm. stuff with Iago I just thought was like it was just so perfect yeah so so perfect it just like made me understand mm -hmm. him as a character even more actually mm -hmm. um because as a per like you know when you first encounter a shakespeare text you're like okay what mm -hmm. are they saying and it mm -hmm. kind of like kind of have to play catch up while you're watching it like, mm -hmm. oh yeah that, that's that's what they said um but with iago it was like it helped me so much to understand his soliloquies so mm -hmm. i like i love that yeah um, mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah I Nice <laughs> Love that. Uh, well, I think for me, like the projections enhanced my viewing experience uh, because it just allowed, as we said, the story to move. And one of the things I liked about the projections was that it left the stage so open because I find a lot of times when we get these bigger physical sets on stage, there's a lot more willing suspension of disbelief the audience has to do because these aren't big sets that can move on and off stage, like uh, 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 you can in a proscenium where you kind of can get some of these bigger pieces off. So sometimes you gotta be like willing suspension of disbelief it, where it's like, oh yeah, that isn't there. Like, like uh, I find I find it happens a lot of times when I'm watching one of the musicals on the festival stage, where you gotta kind of gotta do a little bit of willing suspension because the sets can't change except for like moving a table on and off. Uh, mm -hmm. But I found with this, because you weren't encumbered by that, the world just mo came and moved alive so much better because you could move to all these different locations yeah. and you weren't just relegated to that table represents us moving into a new building. Now you actually got to see this bigger world that Othello and Iago and Desdemona and Amelia all inhabit. And the fact you're changing countries as well. So this is so like all these projections were allowed you to do this type of work and the lighting was just so much m more with this production. Like I think my favorite was when they had that alley going from the um, yeah. stage upstage right 
corner going all the way down into the bottom stage left bomb in that big long diagonal and it was right between um rodrigo and and, and um yeah uh, yago mm -hmm. and it was just wonderful with the way they did the shadows and all this kind of great lighting play and it just let this world be so much more mysterious and once again playing with those masks of the world where it's which mask are you wearing the fact that you had these characters doing scenes behind these scrims of fabrics once again it was them revealing a little bit of themselves and then once again right back in behind the mask so it was this playing on this once again theme of what's behind that veil of political correctness we all put up yeah. when we're at when we're out in society so just to add one because i'm just thinking of this now my little my little mm -hmm. dramaturgical brain has been sparked again the mm -hmm. specificity of the projections kind of got muddier as it went on because if i'm remembering mm -hmm. like that alley scene and the yes. erection of the neighborhood doors and everything was yeah. literally like a pencil sketch out of mm -hmm. specificity to scenery yes. but then as we kind of clicked along it became very like emotional states and like i said like mm -hmm. the washing and the fogging and things blurred mm -hmm. um and and it became like i said as a, as opposed to like stark black white sketching this mm -hmm. sort of gray gooiness um mm -hmm. as as it went on so wow the d see it just never ends you can just <laughs> when i find an element that i can just keep digging and digging and digging and you're like yes you know that 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 is that is some good stuff that is some mm -hmm. yeah yeah wonderful wow wonderful uh tanisha i'm gonna let you kick off our next question so the question is did this modern setting and adaptation uh give uh iago a clear motive for his actions against Othello. Because a lot of times we struggle with that. Of yeah, why is, is Iago? As a person who's like never encountered this place, mm -hmm. so it's interesting that um, me having to answer this question, I was like, I sat there and I thought about it for a minute. I'm like, what did I really think that he was after and why? Mm -hmm. And the only answer that I could come up with personally, I was like, that he wanted to be with Desdemona. And I know that there's just like, there's more to it. Like I know that it could be about race as well, but like just this production for me, I didn't get that. I just, he was so, um, oh, sorry, let me pull up um, who played uh, Iago. Gordon, Gordon Miller. S. Yeah, Gordon S. Miller, who played yes, Dr. Caius and Mary Wives. So very different yeah. characters. <laughs> so um, okay, yeah, so he did just such a great job of being like, this manipulative like creepy guy that what when it came for like what was his motives to me it just it was all creepiness and towards Desdemona and wanting to be with her and less about like even the race or even uh because I know that um when Othello is brought down like he does mm -hmm. Iago doesn't take his place in the army so nope. I, that couldn't be his motive either it's Cassio who ends up uh, you know, advancing in rank. So I was like, that couldn't be it either. It has to be just like this creepy element of him. So mm -hmm. it, the modern setting, it kind of didn't really give me a clear motive, but if there was one, that was it for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I also I... want to play again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Delve into it more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, David, for you, I mean, having been in the room with Gordon as as this play was being rehearsed and developed, like, uh, what kind of stood out to you in this modern production? I, I, did you have any talks with Gordon about his characterization uh, uh, of Iago? Not really, but the next time I tell see him, I'm definitely going to tell him what you said, because there's absolutely nothing in the text to support that. That's mm -hmm. what you were reading off of his body language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Not a word in the text to support that. He, mm -hmm. he states his case in his first soliloquy. I hate him because he is black. Yeah, Here's I forgot it. that. Um, he also suspects that him and his wife, or uh, that Othello and his wife had something going on at some point. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's it's his own jealousy and, and um, he expected to get the job that Othello did get. He was passed over for Othello okay. uh, to become general and take this force to Cyprus. Right. Um, and the reason Cassio gets it is because uh, 
Diago's plot is busted. And media busts him in front of everybody. Yes. So he's disgraced. So the hell with him, Cassio, you're gonna get the job. Mm. Right. But I'm, that is totally, you totally read that off of Gordon's body language, probably the way he looked at it when he was in the room. But that was, right. that was, uh, that was an actor adding yeah. layers upon layers upon layers because right. completely justifiable, absolutely justifiable. Yeah. yeah. And good on you for reading that off of him. That's so cool. Well, it was in the way that he treated uh, his wife. And then well, that that too, that too was really rich in this in this piece. The difficulties that those two were having. Most most productions you see that just sort of glanced over. You know, this is just a bickering uh, couple. But she really loved him and really wow. wanted to get him back. Yeah. And mm -hmm. again, that's credit to Laura. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's mm -hmm. the the layers that she, she decided to put underneath these words. A different actor might not have played it the same way. Mm -hmm. Credit to both of them because they really yeah. pulled out that relationship. Oh, absolutely. They really connected. Yeah. That's why I thought that. I was like, okay, so he's done with his wife. He's over her. He wants Desdemona. Like, that's why he's being this creepy. Mm -hmm. Dude, I totally <laughs> forgot. In the oh, beginning, he says, I hate him. Even though it was, he did so well the whole production, it was just mm -hmm. those, he fleshed out the relationship so well with the people that that's, that's what. His motives were. Dirty. That's why the best part in that play is Iago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Othello doesn't have the same kind of relationship with the audience that that Iago has. Iago comes downstage and he talks to you all, yeah. and he tells you his plan. Uh, Othello almost never talks to you. Right. Uh, put out the light, then put out the light. He's talking to the light. He's not talking to the audience. And then he starts talking to the sleeping Desdemona. He's not talking to you guys. Right. But Iago has all of this time with you guys to build mm -hmm. a relationship, to make you love him. So you'll, you'll cheer him on as sick as that is, but you cheer him on. And, and might I, even... I just want to address what you said earlier about the, the, the strength and power of, of the female characters. Shakespeare doesn't write heroes. He writes mm -hmm. heroines. Yes. Yeah. Most of his plays have got these incredible women living in this world of men. Mm -hmm. And 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 Iago's not a, a, a hero in the conventional sense of hero. He's the guy you cheer for, but he's not, you know he's not a hero. You know he's scum of the earth. Mm -hmm. And no more is is a, 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 is Othello a hero. Amelia is the hero. Yeah. That play, you know? Yeah. Uh, the Merry Wives of Windsor, the, the women are the heroes in that play. None of the men are heroic, but right. the women are, you know? Yeah. Right. I was, there was this really interesting theory. If you get, if you get on the, uh, you know, who really wrote Shakespeare, um, there's this guy that is convinced that, uh, that it was a woman. Mm -hmm. um, oh. because, and, and he used for his argument that he writes such incredible women but the men are all so dysfunctional. Uh, hmm. Like Beth, uh, the Henrys. I mean, all of these guys are messed up, but the women, they're the strength. They're the strong. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that are get together. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that really know what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. While the right. men are flapping and floundering. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> nice. Well, well said. Uh, um, Jill, you were, you wanted to jump in there. Yeah, just because uh, a, a good tie-in to what Tanisha and what David just mentioned too of um, Gordon S. Miller's depiction of Iago, like you were saying, David, absolutely, like Iago's the one that talks to the um, the audience and like quite honestly has more asides than, I don't even think Othello, ha I mean, his asides are, if anything, was that one moment when he was upstage, but he was commenting clearly on like what was happening in front of him as opposed to like letting the audience mm -hmm. in on it. And it was interesting though, like not only did Iago, like Gordon S. Miller's Iago have these asides that it is his relationship with the audience, but I found also in his conversations with the characters on stage, very often, like almost like 80% of his conversations, he would throw out a lot of the dialogue to the audience so it's not even like necessarily being like i'm talking to you now but it's like a, a another layer of manipulation was him like throwing his words away from the conversation and like 
trying to get the audience on his side or like, you know, like purposely de not giving eye contact. So um, I totally agree with Tanisha and like this Gordon S. Miller's Iago specifically. And again, talking back to the set projections mm -hmm. and this sort of like what my brain was doing, piecing those two together. Um, I think it was like a classic case of the element of his like disgust and, mm -hmm. and opposition to Othello mm -hmm. and the whole discussion of race was the root, but then like, mm -hmm. And you see this so often in people nowadays who are bigoted and um, conservative. Uh, you know, you find sort of like their persona is not um, necessarily like flushed out in mm -hmm. a certain way either. It's like it's like they have these opinions, and then once you also get to know more of the person, you kind of know like okay, that's why you're like that. Like, and it's not mm -hmm. justifying it, but it's like, there's something heavier at hand here. And I think mm -hmm. the fact that these projections and like Gordon's take on it too, was like, we really got um, sort of like, a, we got to be like a camera inside of Iago's psyche. And at least Gordon S. Miller's Iago was like, not um, mm -hmm. like, just operated on a very different plane than mm -hmm. anyone else on stage. And like, so sorry, I'm just trying to like gather my thoughts with, cause that was like a tangent into my notes, but um, also sorry. Yeah. So like the selfishness of, of the everyday kind of rings out more um, in a relatable sense with this production too, because like, mm -hmm throwing it in a modern setting too, where, and especially in having it be a bunch of like modern soldiers, there kind of is that through line of like every man for themselves, you know, like even though you are like a squad, you are a team, um, there's, there's kind of, there's that, there's that like backstabbedness uh, mm -hmm. presence with this modern day produ project production um and quite honestly too like this iago to me shot from the hip quite often and it was funny because near the end he's like wounded in the hip and i was like i found that to be really cool and then how eb um eb smith was the one to kind of like dig in the final like into his hip to take him off stage and i was like yes i love that eb was the one to remove iago i was like snaps for that because it took his like motive and that whole character full circle because it was like you had this sort of if, if this is a modern day setting you know you have this sort of i'm gonna say it like small-minded way of looking at the world and like mm -hmm pegging like unnecessary qualms against people who are supposed to be your allies and then like this this is how it's kind of was like a, a wake-up call like this is like you're not you're not winning you know because 100 percent iago's character like doesn't win in this even though he does survive like we all know he doesn't win and i just like i had to mention the the idea of eb taking him off stage because i'm like yes you did not win um so, sorry, that was a really roundabout way of answering that question. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think it's just, like, his, his motive is clear, like, in the text. And then, but I think, like, this, this projection took it way deeper and m added multiple layers within him as a person, but then extracted that away again. And to be like, you, you know, you can have your thoughts and opinions, but like at the end of the day, like call you, we're calling a spade a spade. Like you're not, you're not winning here. And it was like really refreshing to see that final moment of him leaving the stage uh, flushed out in that way. Mm -hmm. um, I have to disagree. Yeah. I have to okay. He does win. I'm about but to say the, the same thing. Was littered with dead bodies. He's yeah. still alive. And nobody says anything about killing him. They're taking them away. Yeah. But nobody says anything about him being about him dying. So mm -hmm. ultimately he does win. Everybody else is dead. Except him. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and, and that's that's his last line. Uh I'm stabbed, but I am not killed. And then <laughs> drives the drives his fist into his wound but 
he's still alive and everybody every he succeeded he's yes. destroyed everybody he wanted to destroy it's gone mm -hmm. right yeah I, yeah, David, David, that was in my notes too. That Iago, I was, I was going to rebuttal Jill as well. Where Iago wins, he he, he destroys Othello and Desdemona like he want, like he sets out to do at the top of the play. He had one goal. It was get rid of them, and sure enough, by the end, they're gone. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what made uh, Iago, uh, first of all, his motives are we're never fully clear. I mean, we've seen so many interpretations of why is he beyond the fact that I hate them more. That's his one kind of go line. But like I was watching a, um, a program, uh, uh, um, uh, it's called, what was it called? Uh, but, 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 it's it's called something like between the lines, something like that, where we're at, where a different celebrity t uh, explores a Shakespeare play. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so there, so there's one with Christopher Plummer exploring King Lear, one with Kim Cattrall exploring, uh, Auntie Cleopatra there. Uh, and then I, and then I forget the wonderful actor who was exploring Othello, but even he goes like throughout history, people have kind of pondered Iago in, his, in him. So while like the, the play never gives us all the things we need to fully understand Iago, what I think the setting did was it helped us understand him because we're seeing people like him in the world mm -hmm. that are becoming more brazen, coming to the forefront, coming out of these woodworks where they're ripping off their max, uh, masks and are full on just out, like, out and out being racist and saying, simply, I hate the more. Like that we're seeing these people more and more and more now coming out. And Gordon S. Miller, what he did was he made Iago less mustache, like, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to get him, but he made him human. He made yeah. him realistic. Like the fact this Iago, he wasn't this built tank of a man. Like don't worry, Gordon S. Miller is still a very fit person, but like he was still very human. Like he had a bald spot. He, he was a little bit unshaven. He was, he not like six pack. He was kind of modern looking everyday man. And he, he was realistic. And that's what made him so a much more scarier Iago mm -hmm. is that, we're seeing a very human person take the stage and be somebody who could be sitting in that audience watching the show because I'm sure if we all look through our friend lists, we know these small minded um, racist um, pe uh, people that we've come across in life, whether they be family, family friends, whoever, who like, who like, sometimes when they say something, you kind of do the, what did you just say? That type of situation. And the fact that that's what Gordon S. Miller brought to this role was that he made the I hate the more line such a definitive statement of this is it. I hate him. I have no reason to. I'll make up some reasons that kind of give me some type of justification. But really, I got nothing else beyond I hate him because he's black and he's the more. That's it. And that was driven right through like a like a like a 18 wheeler truck throughout this whole piece was just <laughs> i hate him i hate him i hate him and i'm gonna do everything in my power to destroy this man um and yeah i i i, I just think that that's what gordon miller did was he made it a very human a human iago he wasn't machiavellian he was the everyday white man who we are seeing more and more in the world now, unfortunately. Who does it with wit and charm and great uh, You know, the modern face of the clan, that 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 guy that somebody punched in the face. I was so happy the other day. Uh, <laughs> the leader of the uh, the alt right, mm -hmm. very clean cut, always wears nice suits, speaks mm -hmm. educated and articulate, and 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 tries ever so hard to be charming and witty. Uh, but that's, again, that's what makes those guys compelling. Yeah. That's what makes that, and anybody that is sitting in the audience, they're cheering, they're going, yeah, yeah, get them, mm -hmm. yeah, do it. It drives home to like, especially this in depiction, like the power and sway that an individual like Mac gave us a wonderful description of, uh, can have on a whole state like a whole country, a, a whole um, community of people, you know, and 
how scary that is and how that is rippling through our very world right now. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The Yagos are out there and we are seeing them more and more and more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is scary. Uh, the Yagos are the world and the guys that are making the world because they're smart yep. and yes. they're powerful and they're witty and they know how to manipulate the system. Mm -hmm. uh, the founding fathers were very bright guys. Uh, yes. Thomas Jefferson was an amazing dude, mm -hmm. but he was also banging one of his uh, servants. Mm -hmm. I saw this thing the other day. He put a notice in the paper looking for a runaway slave and I'll pay you $50 to bring him back and I'll give you $10 for every hundred lashes you give him up to three hundred dollars. Oh, wow! Do the math. <laughs> yeah. And the bottom line is, nobody would survive that many yeah. times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but this was Thomas Jefferson, the mm -hmm. founding father, and this is a notice this guy put in the newspaper, and that is the face of real racism. Mm -hmm. These are the guys we got to worry about. I don't need to worry about the guys with the Confederate flags in the pickup trucks. I need to worry about the guys that are are, are manipulating a, a, a tax benefit to the super rich. Those are the guys I need to worry about. Mm -hmm. Those are the guys that are hurting me and everybody else that doesn't have multi-million dollars. That is the real face of racism now. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know? mm -hmm. It's not guys in pickup trucks. It's guys in suits. For wisdom. What, Tanisha? Sorry. Wisdom from David Collins. Yeah. Yeah. More wisdom from David Collins. I love that. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, okay. So now we're going to kind of dive more into the text of this play um, and just kind of explore these characters a bit. And uh, Jill, I'm going to let you kick this one off. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, do Amelia's actions in Othello's plot make her the secondary villain of the piece or is she another victim of this play? So I struggle with this question because like I, first of all, hundred percent, she is not a villain. I refuse to make her out to be a villain, even though the text could paint her that way. I think just using the production we saw as a case study, it is very evident that you can say those lines in a way that absolutely makes her not a villain 1000%. I think she falls victim to Iago like a lot of people in this in this play do. Mm -hmm. But like it goes back to what David was saying like to me she's like the true hero of this piece. Um mm -hmm. and yeah, and it goes back to what I've said too um and again using the production as as a case study that her her voice is not squelched and it's like that there's something there's there's power in the way that this female character is written because like her status is very secondary and very like underneath her husband and you know her initial motive is sort of painted out to be her wanting to get her husband back but I think there's just like so much more that comes out in her as the piece goes on um and it's that wonderful like she's sort of it's kind of like what we were talking about with Mary Wives, with M Mistress Ford and um, Mistress Page of like they're innately kind of like have heroic qualities. It's not like dawned upon them or they like grow through the men in their lives to have them. It's like she kind of just has this sort of like fiery independence mm -hmm. off the get go. Um, Cause I even remember seeing Deborah Hay as, as Amelia. I remember she had that same, like that fire to her from the very beginning, even though I remember her depiction of Amelia was a bit more subservient as uh, Laura's was. But um, yeah, I think she just like, she falls under Iago's like spell of love and um, the, the sense of security that he gives to her. Um, but then, you know, she has a realization that she, you know, uh, once she kind of sees beyond rose colored glasses that following this hateful, deceitful man um, is not the be all and end all. And when she kind of coincides with all the other female 
voices in in this piece um and realizes the sort of like not only the betrayal of herself that Iago places upon her, but the betrayal of the women and the other females that she shares a space with too. Um, definitely, like I said, makes her more of a hero. So a victim to Iago 100%, but then I think it's through that, like she, she comes out, she comes out on top. Absolutely. Yeah. Tanisha, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, like, I, I totally agree with everything Jill said. I put down another victim of Iago's. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, exactly, like, especially the way it was played by Laura. I mm -hmm. um, have read the, I've never, like, encountered the full text of Othello, but I had read her monologue before. Mm -hmm. And it was mm -hmm. so interesting because I, like, read it, and I think maybe I, like, did it, you know, for, like, an audition or something. Um, Same. Yeah, I was... I approached the text so differently. Like Me too. it was, it just blows my mind was, to actually see the full story. And then like Laura, like really flushed out her character. It was so rich and beautiful to see. I was like, Oh my gosh, that's like a, that's a human being who I can like relate to and just see. And, and just now her whole speech made so much more sense. And I was like, Oh my God, the way I ever did it. I don't even yeah. know how I ever did it. Like, that, like David Collins says, like, you can be here or you can be here in the bar of <laughs> And, like, that is just what I saw. And I definitely, like, it, it made me, I think I said this on another panel, but I will say it again. Like, it made me realize that there, I uh, want to say this again, that, like, there are no, like, villains or, like, heroes. There's only, like, or, like, good or bad people. So there, we're all just people who do good or bad things. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like she was like a bad or a villain or anything like that. I was like, oh my gosh, she did a bad thing and didn't realize why it was bad. And now she is. And now she's the truth teller, which actually kind of, yeah, makes her mm -hmm. like the best one. Um, uh, yeah. And so that's, that's what I got out of it. Um, uh, let me just check my notes, make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, Oh, yeah, and I just, I loved the direction or, like, the block. I don't know who chose to do this, but there was a moment where she's like, no, I'm not, the, the text says, she's like, I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to give him the handkerchief. I don't know what he wants with it, and he's he's kind of, you know, uh, I don't really trust that. I'm going to get somebody to copy it. But then Iago, like, uh, goes to, like, fake you for a kiss and gives her a kiss and then takes it, and she's, like, <sighs> devastated, and it's like, Ah, because she <laughs> wanted that kiss mm -hmm. over the handkerchief, but then at the she realizes what she did. It was so beautiful to watch. Yeah, so, like, yeah, her, her performance showed that the question is um, something that you definitely can answer as an actor as well. Because that's me thinking of when I did it. I was like, I definitely was probably just like, I don't even know. I don't even. Know. But yeah, it just made me realize that you can definitely do so much as an actor with this text. Mm -hmm. that uh villainous or not villainous it's yeah. funny you said that too tanisha because like that monologue is in like my arsenal works too and like i've always approached it in kind of like more of a comedic sense of like oh we're just having a chat with desdemona but then seeing it on stage i'm like why was i ever like brainwashed to think that reading that speech like in a comedic sense is like i mean it's okay i guess but i'm like no, 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 like there's a lot more depth to this girl that you're kind of, mm -hmm. for some reason, not giving her. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it just kind of goes back to like a bit of a broader concept, David, you being like the females are the heroines of this piece. Like it kind of mm -hmm. put fire under, under my butt again of being like, I need to reevaluate the, the status and prowess that these females have in all these pieces. Cause that's all okay because you're yeah. You look at that same speech 10 years from now and you'll see something completely different because you'll right. have had all kinds of different life experience. You'll have seen other people do it. <clears throat> That's the wonderful thing about this material. It's so rich. Right. Every time you do it, 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 it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper, you know? Mm -hmm. the, uh, yeah. the audience gets to see the, the tip of the glacier, but the glacier is freaking enormous and the older it is the bigger it is you know it's, right so i mean it's all valid every you know whatever you did with that monologue 
it's all good. That that was your perspective on things then. Right. Now, you look at it now, it'll be different. And again, you look at it again in 10 years, and it'll be completely different. Trust me. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I mean, think, I think she was a victim of her own love. Yeah. Mm. That, uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. That, that how relatable is that, too? That's like a big relatable <laughs> point, too. Haven't we all done it and done it? over and over and over again some of us I yeah mean, i mean i mean actually wrote in my notes she is a victim of love and a fellow and a fellow's web she basically is another fly caught in his kind of trap that he sets up um but i i, I but i i put it down to amelia can go many ways i mean it depends on the actress and it depends on the and it depends on the production of how you play amelia i mean i mean laura did a fantastic job of playing this wonderfully heroic Amelia who at the end I cheer for her like I was like yes like rip off Iago's mask and give him the stab to the gut because he yes. deserves nothing less <laughs> like give it to him honey like you got it um but then I was like well I mean I, I, I mean you, call, you also could direct it a totally different way where Amelia is very much like Iago like very much against the marriage of, of Desdemona and Othello making her more of a Lady M type figure who by the end, when she realizes what she's done, her guilt is what drives her to do the uh, turn on Iago in that final moment. But like, you can go so many ways with Amelia. Like that's one. Of, like, she's one of those great characters where she gives you a lot of room to play. Where a lot of times it's like, like does like, like, like if, if, if it's always between Desdemona and Amelia, I'll go for Amelia over Desdemona because I mean, like just yeah. watching, like I mean, Amelia playing Desdemona. Like she, her, her, her performance really brought to light where there's a lot of, like even though Desmond's a strong character and her love for Othello is beautiful and strong and her commitment to him is wonderful, her lines are a lot of, "Honey, it's okay. Like I'm innocent here. Like it's a lot of very repetitive thing. It's kind of almost like Tony Westchester where he where where he goes the whole time, Doc, I'm in love. And it's like okay, we got that in the first scene. We're now at the end of the play. What more can you give me? Like Desdemona, I think falls into that trap well amelia there's so much more yeah. gray and things to esca like, um, excavate um yeah. with, with her character that i just don't think desdemona has even though desdemona is a very strong character in her <laughs> own right for what her at for, for her choices like when she's dying on the bed and she doesn't give othello up it's othello who gives himself up yeah. she doesn't uh blab to uh, amelia going it was him he did it to me like she goes I'm a victim of, uh, like of my own making. So mm -hmm. like that still gives Desdemona power at the end. But I mm -hmm. think um, Amelia too is a very much a, another strong mm -hmm. female role to Canada. Once again, we kind of overlook just like the Mistress Page and Mistress Ford where we kind of go, oh, Othello, Desdemona, got it, okay. <laughs> but it's like, no, 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 there's somebody else who's just as strong who is actually the real kind of, has the hero moment of the play that we oftentimes kind of whoop, over. Okay, let's head to this next uh, question, mm -hmm. and it's a um, yeah, it's an interesting one that I'm excited to hear people's opinions on. Mm -hmm. So the question is: Is this a play specifically about blackness, or is it about otherness in general? Uh, could you swap Othello's gender, or or make him another minority? So then I I listed some examples in the question for to kind of spur the thought process, where it's like: Could you have an Asian actor play Othello? with an all Caucasian cast? Or could Othello be a woman in an all male cast? Or, or, or vice versa, where like Othello is, is the only male in an all female cast. So, uh, David, I, I, David since, since you've lived in this world much longer, like, what do you think about this question? Like, where do you, like, where do you go with um, Othello? That's an interesting question. Uh, but I think you start messing with gender mm -hmm. and race you throw out the poli the dangerous sexual mm -hmm. politic of the sanctity of white womanhood. Mm -hmm. yeah. This play absolutely pays an homage to. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, there's nothing in the world more threatening to a, 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 a white father than a black man chasing after his daughter. It would mm -hmm. turn it into a completely different dynamic mm -hmm. uh, if you switch up genders. Yeah. It's, you know, it's an image that's been embedded into our heads mm -hmm. uh, for 400 years mm -hmm. uh, that only got exasperated 
by uh, by the by the KKK, by the alt right. Mm -hmm. You know, those are exactly the. I mean, that's part of the credo of of, of the KKK to preserve the sanctity of white womanhood. That's part of their justification for why they have to uh, keep black people in line. Mm -hmm. It's you know all for God and, and, and the way God. But that's one of their one of the things on their declaration: the sanctity, the sanctity, protect the sanctity of white women. Mm -hmm. So, would it be the same kind of play? I, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Well said, uh, Tanisha. What are your thoughts go going off of David? Yeah, that, I think this is a great question and I, I was torn and I thought about it for a lot and then mm -hmm. like I really thought about the language that I heard in the play and like what this like what the story was about mm -hmm. and I thought um, it's just it, was, it took me a while to like come to this realization because I was just like I didn't want to say it but I was like I feel like this play yeah, that's exactly like what David said. It that's what it's about. So if you kind of like change it, you're losing the act, the story of what it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like what it was about. And I, mm -hmm. like, if the person identifies as a person of color, then I feel like yeah, go for it. Um, but if if not, then I don't know because it just it's gonna change the story. And I feel mm -hmm. like because the word this might be personal, but like come when I this is me first coming across this text again when I was watching it, the word more, the way it was used, it wasn't just used to describe him, like, be, like, oh, like the color of his skin. It was also mm -hmm. used in the way that like people would use the N word. Okay. And, and like, that's like their mm -hmm. version of it, but like 1400 mm -hmm. years ago, whatever. Yeah. Um, and so that's why I was like, I, I don't feel like you can change it because like that it's mm -hmm. so specific and that like, mm -hmm. oh, it's an archetype that we yep. as a society really understand. Yeah. It's the archetype that I have to fight against every time I'm in the grocery store. Yep. And I'm pushing my cart and a white lady sees me and holds her purse because she sees that archetype. She doesn't see David, she sees the archetype. Yeah. I'm, I'm, he's dangerous and I'm under threat. Yeah. And that's an archetype we understand very well in the society. That's the archetype that we're trying to bust down right now. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think, like, I'm sorry, but like, it's, like, it's for black people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I hate saying it, but like, it is. No, like, yeah. No, absolutely. There are stories have, like, to one... be told that are specific. Yeah, and like, she's your road to this. And I'm like, it's okay for us to have it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> absolutely. No apologies. No, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Jill. Yeah, your, just your just exactly what they said to you. I think absolutely, especially if we're talking about like relevancy, like a fellow still needs to be a black man. Like, and I think forevermore, um, uh, unfortunately, no pun intended, because um, I don't, I don't think it'll resonate. It just, I think it does a disservice to like not only the text, but just like to to the way that we're interpreting our text. You know, like there's something to like, even if you do make him an another other um it's just like why like you know there's mm -hmm. there's 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 sometimes there's moments and and interpretations of text that i think are are going too far or too abstract when it's like we need to deal with like what we're given now and like mm -hmm. put that on stage and like mm -hmm. to me i i just think like that there's there's so much more that can happen with this too like even David was saying flushing out or changing the racial identities or gender identities of other characters. Like now that adds like, you know, a different mm -hmm. twist or spin on, on um, the whole idea of, of race and gender politics in this piece that, mm -hmm. that can be flushed out too. But I don't think you can strip away um, the, the race of, of what, who this character is supposed mm -hmm. to be. Um, and yeah, there's just so much of his identity, like, mm -hmm. like of himself and of what all the characters sort of see him as or lend him to be that I, mm -hmm. I think it would just sit very foreign in any other sort of race or, or um, gender mm -hmm. um, identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I'll say, I think 
you're all, you're all absolutely right. Where like I wrote, this is one of these stories that is very specifically designed to be told by a specific actor. Uh, however, I do I, I, doing my research. People are trying to do different adaptations of that, and I think that's where we're now going into this. The people are trying to pull it into the realm of otherness versus uh, blackness. Like, uh, mm -hmm. like I mean. This, as David said, this was written by a white man about a black man based on the, the, the short story of Incapitan Amoro, a.k.a. The Moorish Captain, by uh, Sintetio. Uh, like, this whole story was about that topic. And that's just the way it is. Like, uh, I, I just like you can't make Shylock not Jewish because that defeats his whole Hath not a Jew's eye speech. Mm -hmm. You can't. Like, I, sure, you can make a fellow anybody else. You could. And just have more as a descriptor kind of insult line thrown. But it doesn't have that same power as it would if it's not a black man playing that role. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what happens. I mean, like, in my research, like, Patrick Stewart did a race reverse production where he was the only white guy and it was everybody else was black. Like, he did that. Like, he did that production uh, recently in... Uh, in and a uh, white guy isn't that dangerous sexually exactly yeah doesn't have that same kind of of danger mm -hmm. right. yeah. you know it would be soft well even in this production like when when michael blake like hits amelia like listen to the audience they're like oh when i'm like yeah was that the audience how many that times that yeah yeah Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And I really like, wonder I was like was that an actor in the background making that sound or was that like no, no, audience? And you got to, you know, uh, we did it sometimes for, you know, a couple of thousand 18 year olds. They're going to react. It's going to be visceral. Yeah. And actually I I I I love it when the reaction as long as the reactions have got something to do with the play, mm -hmm. the bigger the louder it is the better. Yeah. If it's if the reactions are, are trying to be disruptive or trying to take people out of the play, that's when I want to come in with a baseball bat and shut them down. But yeah, yeah, yeah. If they're making noise mm -hmm. uh, in reaction to what's going on in the play, mm -hmm. bring it. And yeah. I want to tell you, it, it makes our hearts pound. Absolutely, oh, yeah. God, they're there. They're they're into it. They've taken mm -hmm. sides. They were on Desdemona's side. That's why they react like that. You know, if they weren't on that on her side. They wouldn't say anything, you know. But yeah, overall, I think Othello, give it to him. Like, it's a I, 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 this role is written for a black man, and it should be played by. A, and the fact that we haven't had that happen for like 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 up till nineteen eighties when Anthony Hopkins played Othello, like we haven't had that much time where like a black actor has been given the opportunity to play Othello. Like I, I like there like in this documentary I watched about Othello, there was. I forget the actor's name, but there, in the early 1900s, a black man did come to London and play Othello. And after one perform, thank you. Ira Aldridge. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like Ira, yeah, thank you. I, Ira Aldridge, where like he came, he did one performance, and they shut the theater down, and he never got to play it again. Um, maybe not in London, but he played it all over Europe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just not in that particular West End uh, theater. Yeah. And in fact, uh, they did a production of Othello at Stratford in the 90s. Um, they hired an American uh, film actor. His name was uh, Harold Rollins, mm. was in uh, Ragtime. Yes. And he was also in Soldier Story. He was mm -hmm. the, uh, he was the, uh, the, the captain the, mm -hmm. in, in Soldier Story. Mm -hmm. um, he... Um, he had some problems and uh, and uh, had to drop out. And uh, Joe Ziegler had to go on for him. Oh. And Joe Ziegler <laughs> covered it for the rest. They didn't hire a, a black understudy. No. But Joe Ziegler <laughs> was the last white Othello. In the 90s. In, in the late 90s. Well, that's late that is. 90s. That is. That um... is. Yeah. Well, they didn't. Uh, they didn't hire a black understudy, and they and they hired a guy who was he was a film actor. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a stage actor. Mm -hmm. uh, he'd never done Shakespeare before, but he had he was famous. He oh. was coming off of uh, Ragtime, 
it was either Soldier Story, Ragtime. Or, no, yeah, it was Soldier Story and Ragtime. He was nominated for Oscars, so he had his fame quota was up, but he wasn't prepared uh, for 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 that role for live theater for an eighteen hundred seat theater, mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, and Joe wound up uh, finishing off the role for him. I think he got through opening night, but not uh, the uh, the other actor got through opening night and maybe a couple of shows, and then he just couldn't mm -hmm. do it anymore. Yeah. Wow. So, so yeah, I mean, like, leave Othello alone. Let him, yeah, he play. Yeah, like, like I, I, I don't like. There's a lot of ways you can interpret. Like, I, 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 like I was reading, like, 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 was it been a lot of different productions trying different things. Like, recently at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, they did a, a gender swap Othello where it was a female of color, Faith Edwards, playing Othello, and a white male playing Desdemona, that got reviewed mixed reviews. Um, Recently in Auckland, they had a member of the uh, Maori uh, tribe uh, playing playing Othello in Australia. Um, so people are trying, but I think just let it be. Like, like, yeah. like there are there are wonderful um, black actors, both male and female, who I think could do this role. So just give them the like, give, like, give them the opportunity. Like, we don't have to reconceptualize something. Like, not every show has to be reconceptualized. Some stories are meant to be told by certain people. Like, mm -hmm. I hate to say it, but leave it alone. People, yeah. like, leave it alone. All right, next question. Let's let's do it. We're, 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 we're into the home stretch here, everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, Tanisha, you're, you're gonna kick off the next question, uh, which is, is this a play, uh, sorry, is this play problematic in the way it depicts racialized minorities? Um, so I, <laughs> Oh, I don't want to say about this. I thought no, because this play explores racism and discrimination, mm -hmm. like, and how, and the stupidity of it. Like, if you look at the text, you, there are so many instances where the, it is said that there is no, like, just because he's black doesn't mean that he doesn't have good character. Like, I think mm -hmm. um, the one, like, lady general or something, I forget her character, she, like, says it, she's like, uh, like he's a great person, even though like you think he's bad just because he's black. I forget the line, but it's so mm -hmm. perfect. They said, and I'm like, that that's so so true. But still, people think this today, to this day. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I'm just going to my notes. Oh yeah, so it's like it, it explores how it stupid racism is because it's unfounded and and nothing really real, and that mm -hmm. it's not um. Uh, yeah, and like how discrimination like stems from that, from like these unfounded reasons. Like you hate the guy just because he's black. No other reason. You're gonna just make it up as you go. It makes no sense. <laughs> it's so unfounded. Um, and it, yeah, I like don't think that it's a problematic at all. I actually think like this play, even done today, like shows how far we still have to come because it's like you can recognize the discrimination on stage and be like, oh, like I've seen that before today, mm -hmm. like yesterday, like mm -hmm. in my life. So um, I don't think that's problematic at all. I also think, oh yeah, I wrote that, like it explores the discrimination between biracial couples. And like, I have to remind myself sometimes even being in one that like not everybody is so open-minded. Like some people, yeah, still think like, oh, like, black people should only marry black people and same with white people and it's like it sometimes uh like biracial love isn't just like welcoming like the, f the first instance that came to mind was i don't know if you guys have heard of this show but it was on netflix it was really big at the beginning of quarantine it's called love is blind everyone was into it but anyways the one couple the dad was like oh are you okay to marry my daughter and he was like very questionable about this biracial couple and then like they're still going strong today i love them i follow them on <laughs> <laughs> that's still a thing in people's mind whether they're black or white and this play explores that and like mm -hmm. how it's just like such a silly notion of racism in general um so i thought that yeah that it, it's not problematic it's actually this play is really good to, to continue to do and um yeah that, that's for me mm -hmm. Wonderful. David, what are your thoughts? I, I disagree. I think it is problematic. I think it, it 
vividly, viciously, violently shows you why black men should not be with white women, because mm -hmm. this is the outcome. Mm -hmm. That yeah. is, that's the, the allegory. That's the moral lesson of this piece. Mm -hmm. No, you shouldn't mix the races because everybody's going to die, mm -hmm. and they're going to die awfully. Uh, you know, this isn't uh, uh, an homage to uh, to uh, to biracial relationships. As far as I'm concerned, it's this is why it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, and being the product of a biracial relationship, that particularly uh, when I was a kid, that was the, the argument. Well, what about the children? What are you going to do? The children are going to be all messed up. They won't know if they're black or if they're white. Or da -da. And again, um, you know, it's an archetype that we know all too well in this society. And I think we need to be telling different stories uh, that are more evolved, that uh, the bottom line is <laughs> race is, is, a, is a concept. It's, it's got nothing to do with reality. It was a concept that was uh, invented to divide us. Yeah. The wonderful thing about uh, this Ancestry.com stuff that's been coming out is they're slowly discovering that everybody is multiracial. Mm -hmm. Your red hair and your your pale skin, but somewhere deep down inside of you, you've got genes from India and Africa floating mm -hmm. around inside of you. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you with your red hair and your mustache, somewhere <laughs> deep down inside. And, and that's science and yeah. science proving that mm -hmm. we're all one race. We are all the human race, mm -hmm. and all of these these uh, divisions are 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 are, are manufactured concepts mm -hmm. to keep people in their little slots, mm -hmm. and it's yet another falsehood that we're taught about what life is, and who we are, and where we come from. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've got this, I've got four or five races floating around inside of me, yep. but so does everybody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the more people start uh, doing these uh, ancestry or DNA uh, searches of themselves, the more they're just, I mean, there's, <laughs> there were black people in, in England in the 1600s, but there's no, nobody talks about it. There's, there's no pictures of it. There's, you know, uh, God, there were, there were black people in, in England uh, 2000 years ago. I mean, uh, Caesar sent a, a legion of, of, of African uh, soldiers up to Northern England uh, 2,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And they stayed and they integrated and they went north and south and they went to Scotland and, you know, uh, to Liverpool and, you know, mm -hmm. the gene pool really is a pool and it is, mm -hmm. we're all full. Yeah. I, I, I swear, I think that's why we, we're such an anti-science society because science tells us that yes, we are all connected and ca uh, capitalism wants to keep us all in our little separate boxes. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, uh, yeah, just I could go on. Mm -hmm. I go on, but I'll shut up and let somebody else talk. <laughs> no, that was wonderful, yeah. David. Thank you. No, 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 that's a wonderful point of view that I think each of us, like we all come in with our different points of view and yours are wonderful. Like, I, I, it gives us something that we never would have thought of. So thank you. Like, never well, apologize for going. Yes. Yeah. And just to like, in relationship to that too, like I have been in, in um, an interracial, many interracial relationships. And like, I have had to like precursor kind of like, like my parents are very accept accepting regardless, but like, it was a part of my kind of like, this is who I'm seeing. And like, it's mm -hmm. okay that he's Muslim, right? Or it's okay that he's black, right? Like it was like, that was built into like, and my parents are not the ones to instill that in me. That was just like a social thing that like mm -hmm. was built in me mm -hmm. saying that, like I wasn't asking their permission. It was just like, this is happening and like, I'm just telling you this, but the fact that like society makes it seem like you still have to like justify that is just, it just, it, another thing that like resonated with what you were saying too, David, my, um, one of my parents, really good friends, they're an inter interracial couple too. And she, uh, I'll never forget one day she told me, um, she's white and her husband's black and she was taking her 
I think her son at the time was like six months old. Um, in she was just going grocery shopping, and this was like back in the eighties or nineties, and um, she would have the same looks like at her because you know she was a white woman pushing this baby of color around, and she actually had one woman come up to her and be like, "Oh, um, what, what race is your baby? Is this your baby?" And she's like, "Yeah, this is my baby." What, what race is your baby? And she looked her right in the eye and was like, "Human," like. Mm -hmm. and I was like good on you Sue like especially in the 80s 90s like I'm just like and these things are still happening today mm -hmm. right and it's like because man, it is so like ingrained divide. yes it's so ingrained uh, mm -hmm. it, our educational system teaches us how to be good racists yeah. because it teaches us that white people uh were, were the first society nothing existed before uh Europe expanded uh mm -hmm. And then Europe grew and it, and it went out and it, it saved all these heathen savages from, from themselves and, and uh, introduced them to God and, 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 and created the, all these wonderful societies all over the world. And that's mm -hmm. the history that I was taught, that you were taught, yeah. and my children are, were taught. I mean, still to this day, we're just now facing the absolute lie that white people discovered this continent yep. dude there were millions of people living on this continent yep. and the only way that you can come and take this land away from these people is to dehumanize them mm -hmm. the only way you can stick millions of people in boats and and bring them over here and and work them to death is to dehumanize them and that is the basis of the society slavery and genocide mm -hmm. and that's what we've been working on for 400 years mm -hmm. and it's we started saying it in the beginning who can i trust who can i believe in because most people still firmly believe that that was the right thing to do because look at all this wonderful stuff we have mm -hmm. look at these wonderful cities we built mm -hmm. yeah. but we're ignoring what those cities were built on and who those cities were built by mm -hmm. uh you know and why don't people pull themselves up by their bootstraps because they never got a pair of boots to begin with yeah. you know mm -hmm. well that, said yeah well that's the fact i think like in regards to the question i think they're the shakespeare canon there is is problematic the way racial minorities are depicted i mean if you yeah. look at aaron and titus Shylock and Merchant, Caliban and the Tempest. There's Othello also and... the Prince of Morocco in, yes. in, yes. in um, yes. Merchant of Venice. In, in Merchant of Venice. Mm -hmm. um, a little sidebar. I um, mm -hmm. It was a production of it happening in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And uh, I called up the, uh, the theater and asked mm -hmm. them if uh, I could come and audition for the uh, Prince of Morocco. Prince mm -hmm. of Morocco should be a guy who looks like me. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the phone, they said, yeah, yeah, sure, come down. So I came down and I showed them my uh, picture and resume and this young woman came back and said, I'm so sorry, the part's already been cast. Well, what do you mean? I just spoke to you on the phone and you said it hadn't been cast. Well, in the half an hour it took you to get here, it was miraculously cast. And I went, okay, doke, thanks a lot. So I left and I went to go see the production they hired a white guy and put him in blackface. And that's why they didn't hire me. Because they wanted him to be a clown. And I thought, what a lame choice. Mm -hmm. these, these suitors for Portia should be for real. Mm -hmm. These should, guys should be for real. Serious, rich, hot, sexy, powerful. Otherwise, What's he got to worry about? Where, where's the conflict? If they're all just flute, flute, fluty little clowns, mm -hmm. there's no story. But if these guys are legitimate, yeah. mm -hmm. and the stuff that Portia says about him and these, it's just like, oh man, I used to yeah. like you until I saw this scene, you know? You're great <laughs> in the courtroom, but honey, this yeah. scene, I'm done with you. I'm yeah, I'm bye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. But yeah, I think throughout the canon, there is this problem of the way racialized minorities are depicted. I think if you're going to rank them all of like 
which like which of these characters is most developed, I would put Othello like at the top of that list. Oh, like, Aaron, sure. Aaron and Titus. Oh, Aaron true. Titus. Yeah, yeah. He's a force of nature. He's a scary mofo. Has yeah, he is. Oh, yeah, he yeah. totally is. He's great. Uh, powerful yeah. and uh, Othello in the first half. Yeah, real cool mm-hmm. guy. Big strong mm-hmm. soldier. By the end, he can't. He, he doesn't even have the words to deal with his wife. That's why he hits her. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. When you you don't have words to deal, this is when that comes out. Right. Mm-hmm. And we've watched the disintegration of the, the guy. Mm-hmm. Aaron gets hung at the end, but he's yeah. telling him to stick it to the very last second. Right. Right. Yes. I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like Aaron, for me, like I, 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 I've always found him a fascinating character. But I think what I liked about Othello, like, 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 is just that arc that Othello gets, where, 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 where you see him go from being one thing to another thing. Like, like I always found Aaron. The few times I've seen that play performed, mm-hmm. it always comes across as one note, mustache twirly, where that I. Was- where, then I think it was poorly played. I agree. The arc uh, of I, I, Aaron I, I, is watching this really scary mofo turn into a tender right. guy around this exactly. baby. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, yeah. 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 And that's what makes you love him because you see mm-hmm. the, the dark and the light side of him. You know, yeah. that's his heart busting open for the first time. And a, and a good actor, he'll make you cry mm-hmm. in that scene. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I, I think throughout the whole canon, there's problems. I think Othello, one of the nice things about him is that he falls, as many humans do. I mean, I mean, we all can fall to traps like Iago lays out where it's jealousy, revenge, whispers and rumors. I mean, how many times do we hear stories about partners killing each other over this type of infidelity or, or like entire family an- annihilation happening because of these types of situations perceived but infidelity perceived the real infidelity. problem here was there's a handkerchief that was yeah made. that's why he killed her over a handkerchief dude i mean <laughs> come on okay. exactly yeah, you never handkerchief. heard of kleenex dude i mean <laughs> <laughs> i mean i think i, I think the, about the handkerchief in particular I, I think what makes it a great plot device is that it is something so simple but yet we all get, we all can get hung up on these, on this one thing that really like, if you just took a step back, it wouldn't be a problem. Hmm. But it's the same thing when like you're in a fight with someone where like, I've heard my parents do this, where they have this one piece of ammunition from 20 years ago in a 30 year marriage where it's like that one time where this happened and that is an entire battering ram for an argument. Sure. Like, mm-hmm. Like, it's that thing of what we do as humans, where we fixate on this one thing. Like, I, I, I even have a handkerchief that was given to me by my grandfather before that that has an embroidered H mm. on it. And it is a very special handkerchief that I, that I don't, that I wear on a very special occasions and, and if i were to lose put it away to your girlfriend don't ever give it to your girlfriend. yeah yeah don't, let, me, don't it lend it to anyone <laughs> yeah exactly it ain't going anywhere but it's that thing of like i do have a sentimentality to that yeah handkerchief and, and we all have that type of piece we do we all put mm-hmm. those sentiment s- sentimental ties so yeah. i i think the fact that shakespeare locked into that and went we all fall trapped to this mm-hmm. stupid handkerchief where lives are destroyed Relationships are ruined because of something so minuscule and stupid like a strawberry handkerchief. Well, so yeah. that's why I, I, we, we, we don't all uh, get so wrapped up in it. Uh, Othello's big weakness is he lets mm-hmm. his emotions yeah. exactly. run his actions. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what destroys him. It's not the handkerchief. It's yeah. the way he's reacting to the handkerchief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the, or the absence thereof. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and like you said earlier, all he's got to do is sort of take two steps back and go, hey, yeah. you know, it's not really such a biggie. Yeah. Uh, but uh, again, this is uh, again why I have problems with the with the with the archetype of Othello, because that's mm-hmm. the archetype that black men have to carry around with them. Right. That they're weak, emotionally unstable, mm-hmm. 
uh, uh, dangerous, violent, da 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 Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's the stuff we're trying to dismantle now. Mm -hmm. Right. Or yeah. have tried to dismantle for 400 years. But, uh, mm -hmm. We'll see. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Final question of the night. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I and I want to kick this one off because I okay. think that, this is one that I, uh, as a lover of Shakespeare and education, I have a passion for this topic. Uh, but the question is, is this the right Shakespeare play for students to study in schools? If not, what other play of the Shakespeare canon would you replace it with? So it's a two prong. So I think we should do this play, but in companion with another BIPOC artist play, like do a combination study, not just one. Cause I think if you do just one, then as David said, you're per perpetuating a bad stereotype. But if you do this as a companion piece to another uh, thing with another BIPOC playwright, a modern play that, that depicts just these type of themes and topics, then I think you could have a really interesting conversation. And I don't think we should ever just shove this play away because I do think there are interesting topics and conversations to be had. And one of the reasons why I keep hearing teachers saying they don't want to teach it is because they're afraid of talking about these topics, about racism, about the way a fellow is depicted. And they go, I don't want to talk about it. So because I'm not going to talk about it. And they shouldn't we... be teaching. They shouldn't Ex be teaching, period. Because mm -hmm. exactly what we need is people in there with enough balls to change the narrative. Yes, exactly. We've got to stop protecting. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And that's what I exactly have in my notes. I went, teachers, if you can't <laughs> exactly like if you if you can't have a conversation, and actually engage your students, then don't do it. Like, don't be a teacher because that's what Shakespeare gives us. Shakespeare gives us a platform mm -hmm. and a kickoff point to so many conversations to be had. That's why, as David said in Mary Wives and in this one, that's why he's been around for 400 freaking years. That's why we haven't found anybody really to replace him uh, as, uh, as like a universal study because so much of his stuff generates so many conversations. But I think if you were, if you're gonna have to cut Othello because you really just don't want to talk about it and you're still a teacher, um, what I'd actually replace it with is Richard III because Throughout our, uh, our high school career, we don't touch the history plays at all. We always either do comedy or tragedy. We never actually get into any of the histories. And I think what's neat about Richard is that it's a different way of looking at the concept of otherness, jealousy, and revenge. Because Richard, for the most part, like he is a smart, intellectual, well-brought-up person. And the only reason why he is othered is because of this hunchback that he is born with. And I think you can get into a really, once again, interesting conversation about um, uh, uh, about about disability, about otherness, about jealousy and and, and, and like revenge. I, th I think there's a lot of themes that Othello and Richard the Third kind of share, and you also get another genre. And yeah, I think Richard the Third. If you if you got to replace Othello, then do Richard. Jill, so I'll piggyback off that, Matt, because I kind of disagree with. Ooh you in a way um mm -hmm. i think again sorry i just wanted to say this too like if you have mm -hmm. room between your legs for a tail between your legs then you have no balls so mm -hmm. best best to get out of there i always yeah. that's a little little saying be like you got your tail between your legs where's your balls mm -hmm. um <laughs> but uh i think that this just by the discussion we've been having tonight like absolutely this can this 100 should still be taught in schools and more schools should do it because mm -hmm. i know like it wasn't part of the curriculum through grade 9 and 12 of my high school wasn't some either. high schools i want to say because i went to a catholic high school i don't even think the catholic board touched on this i think our public board did in like a grade 12 option or something but mm -hmm. just from what we've seen and discussed about this production like there's so much more to unpack with this bad boy too like mm -hmm. you know there's the idea of violence there's the ideal mm -hmm. of gender inequality mm -hmm. there's the idea of of expanding this to be like a, a, a bigger more relevant topic on mm -hmm. on gender on racial mm -hmm. politics um mm -hmm. un, just unpacking a, a fellow in general and like i don't like, sure, you could pair it with, quite honestly, the whole English and drama high school canon should be 90% BIPOC and 10%, maybe 10% white, um, maybe. 
that's my whole, and I know like we're slowly getting to that, but unfortunately probably no time in our lifetime will we see that ratio fully flushed out. But um, I think even all the, all the more power to, to having this piece kind of stand in place of any other extremely like whitewashed Shakespeare plays like, um, and, and it like, these the concepts that are at hand here too like are very like we've discussed real world mm -hmm. concepts and I, I've said this in almost every panel we've done and I always said I sound like a broken record and I will always keep saying it um like we have due diligence as theater makers of today to make sure that the pieces we're studying and even in an educational sense um hold relevance and and we are taking old texts and refreshing them in a way for a purpose um it doesn't necessarily have to be a giant political purpose purpose but like you got to have a reason why you're doing it otherwise like don't do it right and like mm -hmm. um and i don't think it's like don't do it because you feel uncomfortable doing it it's something like this it's like if you feel uncomfortable doing it there's like 50,000 people that would feel comfortable doing it so like mm -hmm. you need to ask yourself that question mm -hmm. um but I just think I just think a lot of a lot of kids. I hope um, you know, like every generation now, a generation that has come, the generation to come will always have this discussion. Mm -hmm. Like I hope the generation up and coming is going to be even more um, instilled in this sort of color rich world we live in, and um, I think would would love to like unpack the the psyches of these characters. And like I said, mm -hmm. the, the, the atrocities that these characters go through and, and the, the arc and fall of this black man in this piece. Mm -hmm. And it's so like, that's something that we should be. I would much rather my kids study that than like a Romeo and Juliet in high school, you know? Like mm -hmm. there's so much more that speaks to today in a piece as unfortunate as that sounds, because there's a lot of dark, dark areas of this piece, but it, that's the reality of it, right? And um, I'm kind of going on a little bit of a rant now too, but just with this production at hand of having like digitalized mixed with liveness, like that's again, the world we live in, right? It's like our kids are being exposed to the digital side of life. Like it's one thing to be in like the real world and actual time, but then also like kids at early, earliest age of like third grade have access to a YouTube channel now well their world is just packed with more good and bad things you know way ahead of their time so mm -hmm. I just think like I said we we had the the wonderful opportunity to see a production like this where there's so many levels to this piece mm -hmm. that I think from a sheer like literature perspective that this should be taught in schools mm -hmm. and then a hundred percent just like it, it's it's like an extra a plus thumbs up that it is the main character is someone of color and we're actually taking the time to unpack his story too um mm -hmm. and i go and my final note which i've already peppered into our conversation tonight but like it's the whole idea like at the power and sway that an individual can have on like a community or a state and like we said that through the lens of iago but i think like that lens can be attributed to all these characters like and even like arguably all of Shakespeare's canon like we said like that's why we keep mm -hmm. he is like integrated in our curriculum regardless but like you know we've talked about like the strengths and weaknesses of a ton of characters in this piece alone and I think that like thesis statement of like the power and sway that an individual has within themselves mm -hmm. and within the community at large and how like that can make or break make major decisions and choices. Like those are the lessons that have to be learned at a younger age nowadays, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Mm -hmm. So as like an advocate and a future mom and like um, potentially future educator, like yes, 100% this almost like above, above other Shakespeare's that have been taught or are still being taught in schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mini lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, Tanisha. Um, I honestly agree with everything Jill said. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, like, as a person who didn't learn the true definition of discrimination until I was in 
college, which is some, and like in Soch 101, which is some a class that I had to pay for. Like, I was like, this should be taught in high school where it's mandatory, where you learn things. Like, mm -hmm. I, I totally like see like Dave's point of it being problematic of, of perpetuating that archetype. So I like your idea, Mac, of pairing it with something else. Mm -hmm. That is so useful when you're studying texts. Like, mm -hmm. um, like they still do it now, like in, in high school and in university, and it just mm -hmm. makes so much sense to like to do like a comparison essay or something like that. And yeah, mm -hmm. and like see like and flesh out these ideas of, of discrimination, racism, di and dismantle the archetype from the like a young age. I I'm a big believer of like the youth are the future, so we have to mm -hmm. teach them right. And so, of course, we'd want to start dismantling that archetype with them. And I also mm -hmm. feel like there is so much to be said about, like, women as well in this play. And, um, like, even though Desdemona is a character that, like, it's like, oh, like, the white woman, we don't want her to marry a black man. At the same time, she, like, her voice is, like, never, ever heard. She, like, the, the actress, she did so well, like, going toe-to-toe -to -toe mm -hmm. with Othello. But, like, the character, it's like never gets to actually be heard or believed and um mm -hmm. is kind of like in my mind i was like the black dude he gets to be a general and he gets to like mm -hmm. do all this stuff but like if you're a woman like don't matter like <laughs> what you have to say like your husband's still gonna like i don't know it was just a very weird thing for me like i i still feel like like there's a lot to be said about women um mm -hmm. in shakespeare and yeah and like the one character who i was like disregarding the whole time and being like what is really strong female and I was like wow mm -hmm. so um I I think you could do a lot with this play still mm -hmm. to this day and I definitely think it should be um like in the repertoire I I don't even remember the like some of the plays that I read the only one that I I only remember reading Hamlet and Merchant of Venice so I'm like why didn't I read Othello in high school why wasn't that in my curriculum it's so weird so mm -hmm. yeah I definitely Get it in there, please. Because I'm sure the teachers were uncomfortable. I know, but like, yeah, like, which is awful. Like they said, don't teach. What do you uncomfortable mean? and unqualified. Yes. Unfortunately, unqualified. Most teachers, Thank you. Yeah. they can't touch this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it opens up doors that they're not prepared to go into. The, the education system is, is not prepared to go into these doors. Uh, I, I if you're going to do it in school, you have to have extraordinary teachers. Yeah. Teachers with minds like yours, Jillian, like yours, Jillian. Mm -hmm. they, they got to be, it's not going to be your average teacher. Um, and I've spent a lot of time uh, with Shakespeare in high school, uh, in high schools, and it was a very powerful um, tool to, to get into uh, debating uh, uh, women's issues, violence against women, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I think with uh, teenagers, you got to grab them by the short and curvies. Yeah. Uh, Hamlet is too heady. Uh, uh, Merchant of Venice is too heady. Mm -hmm. uh, Romeo and Juliet, Black Romeo, White Juliet, Black Montagues, White Capulets. Go. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to get them on all kinds of levels. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know that works. Uh, uh, and it works like the Walkman, and it'll, it'll get people a lot more interested in Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. um, Hamlet, you got to be grown. You got to be grown to, to get that play. Yeah. Um, teenagers are, are it, again, it's not sexy, it's not crazy, sexy, cool. Romeo and Juliet, crazy, sexy, cool. It, again, if it's not right, mm -hmm. you know? Yes. Uh, it's full of dirty jokes. It's, you know, full of sex. You and I've actually been to high schools. I remember I was in high school once, and I had a copy of King Lear, and I was looking through it, and they cut all the naughty bits out. Anything oh, referring to sex or groin? Well, I was in North York somewhere, so, and uh, yeah, all the sex was cut out of it. So, you know, oh, you're not even teaching this stuff. You, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know what fantasy you're doing, but uh, mm -hmm. you know it's got nothing to do sh with Shakespeare because in this world, people were interested in that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
And in our world, people are interested in that stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're not prepared to teach or, or to talk about sex and race and politics in mm -hmm. high school. Go get another job, you know? Yeah. The, the, the main point of the education system is not to educate us. It's yeah. to teach us how to read and write. Mm -hmm. And after that, it's up to us to educate ourselves. Yeah. And I fortunately glommed onto that early on in high school. Mm -hmm. This guy really isn't that interested in my future or my brain. Mm -hmm. What he's interested in is a cottage in the Muskokas and a nice boat. <laughs> maybe a, a, maybe a, a, a Toyota Prius for his wife. Mm -hmm. That is this guy's main concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if I want to be educated, I better get my ass to the library and get read a book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I can choose what I'm interested in. And that's mm -hmm. how I'm going to get educated. I'm not going to get educated in school. They're going to teach me how to read and write and how to be a good citizen and work in a factory. Oh. Well, that was not on my uh, uh, five-year plan or 10 right. plan. <laughs> right. So yeah, we got to take it into our own hands. Mm -hmm. uh, being the uh, absolute failure of the education mm -hmm. system, you know? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. David, your wisdom, I think that was the perfect button to the episode. Yes. Uh, I am, I, like, we've gone over two hours with this with this conversation, yeah. which I'm, like, excited about, because that just shows how powerful this play is and why it should still be talked about and, and done, because clearly there is still much to discuss oh, with yeah. this work. Uh, but I think we'll have to say adieu. you for now um we have kind of come to the end of our uh, sh uh shakespeare reviews temporarily we we do have another one uh, uh, uh locked and loaded but we'll wait to announce what the next one will be mm -hmm. uh but for now we will uh have to give our final bow as it were on, on on our stage at least for now because we will be back with another episode down the road for sure the series will continue the review series so stay tuned for more mm -hmm. uh david you're welcome to come back anytime and talk about any play you like <laughs> same with you tanisha jill i mean if you guys ever find a production that's streaming and you're like mac let's like i i i i, I, I let's put up the bat signal let's call the arms here and have a conversation okay let's do it i'm always down for that for mm -hmm. sure. But uh, Tanisha, where can people find you if they want to get in contact with you? Um, so they can find me on Instagram or Facebook. My name mm -hmm. is uh, Tanisha Sinclair, and mm -hmm. you'll find me there on all platforms. That rhyme. That's the name. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. And David, mm -hmm. uh, we know you're on Facebook, so, so, so are, are you still okay with people sending you friend requests from around the world? <laughs> it's it's been a uh, yes. I'm I'm getting very strange uh, friend requests from people that I've never seen, and it's, it's I don't know. I'm new to all of this stuff. You young people, you you got uh, you got this thing down. I got, no, I can barely deal with Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and tweet and you know it's too much too much for me. But I'm usually in my backyard if you're really looking for me. So. Uh. <laughs> What with your you with your you garden know? that you exactly. need to show off to people. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. One yeah. of these days we'll come down and see. Hurry up! Come on down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> August, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Exactly. Hard to believe we're already almost heading into the fall. Mm. Yes. <sighs> crazy times. Jill, where can people find you? Yes, well, I, I am on digital platforms, even though I do have my multicolored pen here, and I would much rather take down handwritten notes of the wise and brilliant David Collins. I, I have been taking a little notes, because I'm a bit of a traditional studious nerd like that. Um, but you can find me on my artist Instagram. It's mm -hmm. Jillian.Robinson96. And you'll find some like singing covers there, some promos for Cup of Hemlock. I've uh, mentioned this before, but coming up quite soon, um, we're, we are right in the nitty gritty process of uh, rehearsing The Man of Destiny, which I have the mm -hmm. wonderful job of virtually stage managing, scheduling that sucker. And the wonderful Tanisha Sinclair will be playing the lady in that. Mm -hmm. So um, look out for all of our cast videos coming out on that mm -hmm. and Tanisha and I are also in um two gentlemen of Verona an all-female cast non-binary cast of um non-female sorry and non-binary uh cast put on by 
Sweet Tooth Shakespeare, directed by Claire Martin, who you have seen um, throughout Peppered In to our cup reviews and cup interview mm -hmm. section of the company as well. Mm -hmm. So that's been keeping us busy. I love that we got to do, on like our night off, Tanisha too, we got to have a discussion together too, which is so lovely. <laughs> um, yeah, so find me, find me on that platform and I hope everyone is still staying safe and well mm -hmm. at this time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, and you can find me on social media platforms at Mackenzie Horner. Just look for the ginger haired photo and you'll find me uh, once again, listen to the podcast I do with Autumn Smith, who is once again also being peppered in throughout our uh, programming where we talk about musicals. Uh, by the time this episode comes out in a few days, we'll be releasing our episode all about the musical Falsettos, mm -hmm. which was a really kind of game changing musical because it was really the first musical that talked about AIDS and the AIDS crisis. So it mm -hmm. was it was uh, a musical very much ahead of its time in the early 90s. So uh, we'll be talking all about that. Uh, we have an interview with Autumn actually coming out on Monday, uh, uh, this cut this past Monday. So be sure to watch that for sh as well. Uh, Man of Destiny comes up September the 9th, mm -hmm. uh, featuring once again, Tanisha as lady, myself as lieutenant. Yes. Every Friday we'll be releasing uh, new episodes uh all about behind the scenes we've recently released a, a video with our director will bartley talking all about why he chose the play and kind of delving into how we're kind of tackling it this time around uh and then we also have our cup round uh, round table series that'll be premiering at the end of the month uh that features uh, a bunch of different people uh, including tanisha funny enough <laughs> uh talking about shakespeare and gender so we'll be talking all about that at the end of the month and uh, we are down to the last 25 days for you to submit your one act play for our one act showcase going up in 2021. So, uh, make sure you get those submissions in to marketing at a cup of hemlock at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so yeah, get that going there, everybody. Uh, but other than that, uh, we thank you so much for tuning into all mm -hmm. this, David. Thank you again. Uh, okay. feel free to come back anytime. For any for any play you want to talk about, we'll happily do that for sure because we love your nuggets of wisdom. They are my wonderful. pen's ready. <laughs> 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 wonderful. But until then, everybody, we will say adieu. Thank you for watching all these episodes, and we'll be back again with more cup reviews in the very very near future. Stay tuned. But until then, Cheers. stay healthy, stay safe, everyone. Cheers. Bye. Cheers.